Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holds bar. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. Our host today, the MMA detective Mike Davis. People overuse the term legend. I'm guilty of it myself, but our guest today is the biggest living legend in the history of MMA. He's won titles in Pancrase, the WWE, and the UFC. The world learned his name 30 years ago, and they still know his name today. It's my pleasure to introduce to our audience the world's most dangerous man, Ken Wayne Shamrock. Thank you for being with us. Let's start with the plugs. I mean, you're here for a specific reason. Let's let's talk about what, what you got going on. Yeah, we, uh, we're getting ready to do a show um, October 27th at the University of North Florida um, in Jacksonville. Very, very excited about it. We started it back in 2019. Um, we were very fortunate that the first show really popped off. But of course, as we all know, COVID popped around and kind of kept people from actually going out. And so we stopped and started um, just kind of more visiting the business model building some apps for getting our business model, getting the pitch deck, getting different things together to kind of build it from the ground up as a business. And so we did that. And then now we're getting ready to do our next show. And we're very excited about it, um, obviously, because the first one we felt was, you know, exciting. But we're very excited about it just because of the vision and, and what it's doing. It's like you see a lot of bare knuckle out there. And bare knuckle seems to be the next kind of big thing that's coming. And... We're trying to take it from a uh, like the UFC did in the early days when you know Bob Meyerwitzen had it and then you know Fertitas came in and kind of organized it and moved it more mainstream. And that's kind of what we're trying to do right now. Whereas we want to organize it because we believe that it's technically sound. It's a very very technical fight organization, I believe. And and, and so you can I, watch this through your app, correct? The Valor app. Yes. And we're in the process of getting that. We already done testing on again. I, I'm not going to get into that because that's not my background, but um, I just want people to know that it's there and we'll be launching that at the same time the fight is going to be launched. So everybody will be cool. having the opportunity to go where they need to go to sign up to get, get that app. Um, and, and again, it's Valor Sports, so there'll be just not just the bare knuckle, there'll be a lot of other stuff up there. So it'll be a pretty awesome app, I think. And so we look forward to that. But the vision in Valor is different. Like we got no cages. Uh, no ropes, no rings, and, you know, no tape to me is the biggest part because I felt like early on when they put gloves on guys, I felt like, wow, hey, this is a great idea, you know, protect guys. Then after I got into it, I realized, wait a minute, they're not protecting me. They're protecting the guys that are doing the punching. I was like, there's this not, it's not safer. It's like literally more dangerous. And so we felt like, let's just bring it back to the God-given talent. If you need something to make you a better fighter, then to me, that's cheating. And so I feel like by taking the gloves off, the tape off, it's God-given talent. What you go right. in with, you and the other guy, and whoever was the best wins. And so we felt like that was a good thing. The next thing is, is I watched too much Mike Tyson fights. And, you know, people game plan Mike, throw a few punches and clinch him. Throw a few punches and clinch him. And so I felt like, you know what, let's take the clinching out. Because to me, I felt like that's another part of boxing, uh, especially when you're talking about the bare knuckle. That if you don't take those clinching out, that's what people are going to do. They start holding and punching one another. And to me, I just like, that's so ugly. Um, and again, I'm not against it. it. Just to me, visually, the way I see it and trying to increase the excitement of the fights is to be able to keep them in a position to where they can throw punches and not be hugging and throwing punches. And so, again, just my opinion. Um, and so that's what we did with this. We took the punching and stuff. The, the no ropes, no cages is also a visually uh, much better for people that are going to be sitting up close. You know, they're going to be able to, when they buy seats, they know they're getting great seats and they don't got to look through something. So that's kind of the whole synopsis of Valor, you know, where we okay. started, where we're at, and, and the visual, uh, the vision of Valor. So joining us, 20 fight UFC veteran, obviously my partner in crime, Chris Lytle. Chris, Ken Shamrock, how big of an influence was he with that of yourself? Oh, huge. I remember when I was, uh, geez, I just started probably 1998. And for Christmas, I remember that year I got the book, um, you know, uh, Shaquem, the, the, uh, the Lions, Day, you know, Baddest Man Alive, whatever, uh, Ken Shamrock, you know, it was, uh, it was, Beyond the Lions, but, yeah, but I, yeah, uh, getting that, it was, and that was like one of the first things, 
you know, really looking and studying. And, and, and you know, I, I was a huge fan of going over to Pancras and, you know, he was a legend over there. So, um, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize, you know, I know we talked about this briefly, Mike, about how everything really for UFC one was totally set up against Ken and, and everybody else and set up for Hoist. I mean, Ken, you fought a few days before and flew out there. Not the same. I mean, the jet lag is unbelievable. But I mean, wait, wait. You, win, you win that fight, and I mean, in 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 the whole trajectory of everything is different. You know what I mean? Ken, wait. Let me. Can I set this table a little bit? You're nodding wait, your wait. head, Ken. L let me set this so everybody can understand. Pancrease three was November eighth, nineteen ninety three. Ken fights uh, Takaku Fuke. And then November 12th, 1993. So Ken goes from California to Japan, from Japan to Denver. That screams jet lag and altitude sickness. <laughs> Ken, please open up about this. Yeah, you know, it, again, I think the thing that most people don't know about, but they're starting to find out because now people are talking about the history of it. But you got to understand, this was back, you know, in 93. Um there was no such thing. I mean, they had commissions. They had uh, rule sets. There's things you can and can't do. I was over in Japan fighting uh, in Pancras because they wouldn't allow you to do it here. And so when they came and, and, and I saw this thing and I inquired about it, they basically said, no, it's for real. You can kick them on the ground. You can headbutt them. You can elbow them. And I'm like, shut up. I said, OK, you know, because I was already doing something like that in Japan. I was like, yeah, let's, let's go. <laughs> and so uh, I remember Art Davies, uh, I remember getting confirmed with Art Davies. And so I go to Japan in my head, defending my title against Bouquet. I knock him out the knee. I get on a plane with Fanaki and the doctor and some other guys. And I remember the whole time we're all going, this is not going to happen. We know it's not going to be the same rule sets. We get there, they're going to change it somehow. We just know it. So we get there the whole time thinking, you know, waiting for this 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 thing to happen. We're like, no, this is how it's going to be because, you know, the commission won't let us do it or, or some excuse. Right. So we get there and we're all on edge. We finally get to what uh, I call the, the point where I felt like, OK, here it comes because they called a rules meeting. First thing was there's no rules. <laughs> so, <laughs> the rules meeting being called was like, OK, here it comes. So we go into this this room and we all sit down and I'm thinking to myself, yep, here it comes. And they literally start running through the things that you can and cannot do. And I'm thinking to myself, I thought this was like, like anything goes. So they list off no taping of the hands. So, our, you know, uh, Art Jimerson is like obviously confused because he doesn't know whether tape, to, to put boxing gloves on his hands or to, to go bare knuckle, right? Because before he was just going to tape them. But because they said no tape on their hands, he didn't know whether or not he should go and maybe he breaks his hand. So he's like, okay, I'll wear one glove and I'll wear one pair. So if I break my hand, I got <laughs> one. So that's kind of the, the thing you're looking at it going, well, wait a minute. Why would you handcuff other people who are coming in fighting in this supposedly no rules fight? The next thing they came up was like, there's no eye gouging, no biting. Okay, I get that. I, okay, I can go with that. Fair. That's fair. And then the next one was you can't wear shoes. That was literally aimed at me. Literally but, at me. But Ken, Ken, let me let me interject, and in I'm apologizing. So we, we're doing all UC1 interviews in October. Art Jimerson said that Big John McCarthy was following him around for the pre-fight workouts, videotaping him, as well as explaining to him what Hoist would do if they ever got to the ground to break his arm. Zane Frazier had Carlos Valente following him around and videotaping, but you were in Japan when they were doing these open workouts. Did anybody from the Gracie Academy come to the Lions Den to kind of videotape you or vet you or follow you around prior to the fight? They didn't need to. They had all kinds of tape on me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I literally had been fighting over there for almost two years. So there was all kinds of tape on me fighting in pancreas so they kind of knew what my skill sets were and by taking my shoes away i had never been on a canvas without wrestling shoes in fact i wrestled in high school i did well there um i went in i started fighting at the age of 26 years old and so wrestling shoes was just part of it and so when they came and said 
no shoes. I literally like in my head, which is dumb, but I mean, you know this, anybody that's a fighter or has got that attitude is like, well, that's not going to matter. I'm still going to kick his ass. So you don't think about those things because you think you're invincible. So in my head, I'm like, yeah, no, that ain't going to stop me. They, they can do whatever they want to do. Think they're going to slow me down, but it's not going to work. Well, unfortunately, it did. It, it was when I stepped onto that canvas, when I fought Patrick Smith the first time, I could I had to spin him around. I wasn't getting footing. So when I went to go try to pick him up, my foot was very unstable because it was slick. And uh, and so it, it became a factor. Uh, obviously, you've seen the first fight and then you've seen the second fight. Things were much different. Um, but yeah, it just, it just felt like, you know, you go in there and they build this thing as this, this, and again, I'm very grateful. Don't get me wrong. I am very grateful because I got to fight and do something I love. But that first setting, when they came in and said it was no rules and anything goes, that is not true. Pretty close to it, <laughs> but not true because they did take away shoes and they didn't let guys take their hands. So Zane Frazier, we had Zane Frazier on. And during the rules meeting, he said he tried his hardest just to kind of ruin it for everybody because he smelled a rat with the Gracies and what they were doing. And he was just being, he said he was, he admits that he was like, I was just being problematic just to be problematic. What do you remember about the rules meeting and how it unfolded? It got kind of chaotic. Um, to me, I was never that guy. Um, to make noise, not there anyways, in the, in the ring and in interviews, I would. Um, but at this thing, it was literally, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you're either going to fight or you're not going to fight and they're in control. Um, and so when that came down, I just didn't let anybody know it bothered me. I just let it go. Uh, there was a lot of guys like Zane and some other guys that were screaming and yelling, there's no rules. Why can't? And a lot of it did it in this, <laughs> whether it would affect the fight or not, who knows? But when you take away something that somebody's been doing for 20 years, which is take their hands or wear a glove, um, and now you're taking that protection away from them, that really that that takes away a lot of your opportunity, especially if somebody's trying to shoot on you, to feel comfortable about throwing a punch, to be able to hit them in the head and still have tape on there to protect it somewhat. Um, and so I, I really felt like it changed the trajectory, and especially myself. Uh, with a lot of guys, not that I think the outcome would have changed, but I think it would have at least gave it more. I think these fights would have been a little more exciting uh, as the tapes would have protected the hands a little better. And you would have had probably guys feeling more comfortable about swinging for the fences. Um, but again, like I said, I don't think it would have, in my opinion, and that's just my opinion. I do not believe that I think it would change the outcome of what happened that night. It's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Pancrase, you had three fights in Pancrase prior to going to the UFC. And you also brought Fouke, your last opponent in Pancrase, as well as the Pancrase doctor. Did you have to get permission to do this? How does that negotiation process start? Well, in my contract, uh, my contract was only for Japan. It wasn't international. Like, if I was in the U.S., I could do whatever I wanted. Um, but I did ask them, and I did show them the tapes. And, you know, they were like, yeah, you know, we're not really excited about this. And I was like, um, but I really want to do it. And, and me as a fighter, I'm never content with just sitting on top of a mountain. If I see something that I think can challenge me in a different way, I'm taking it. That's how I got into pancreas was because I saw it and I said, I want to do that. That looks awesome. I saw the tape of the UFC with Gracie choking guys out. I said, I want to do that because it was like that next level. Um, because that's the competitive guy that's in me. That's who I am is to compete and challenge myself. But they kind of wanted to keep me in a bottle. Like they wanted to keep me there. And like, they didn't want to take a risk of a champion getting beat. And, uh, you know, in my mind, I was like, I'm not getting beat. Who knows he's going to be? No one I thought had a chance of even touching me was Gerard Godot because I knew who he was. I knew he was legit. And uh, I knew that if I got him to the ground, it's all over. So, you know, same strategy Hoist had. That's the strategy I would have had. Just get him on the ground, game over. Um, but I did not see Hoist coming. Um, and that had a lot to do with my ego and the egotistical champion mindset that I had at the time where I believed that nobody could beat me because I had destroyed everybody that came in front of me, even in tryouts. When so the United States, I called anybody, come to my gym, try me out. <laughs> and uh, I was destroying everyone. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy that's 185 pounds comes in and chokes me out. 
And it's like, but, wake up, Paul. Best thing that could have ever happened to me. Not to say I enjoyed it, but it really <laughs> challenged me to really be a better fighter. Did you know, did you, you understood though, like it was his family put it on. It was set up for him to win at the time. You knew that though, did you not? I I didn't know it at the time. I really didn't. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know okay. who he was. You guys yeah. are both California I guys. I figured you guys, I figured you at least knew of him. No, I, I was in Japan. My focus was all Japan and training. And I challenged people from all over the, all over the United States for tryouts to come. And I would wrestle anybody that wanted to be on my team. I would bring called tryouts. I would roll with those guys because I wanted to get guys that were good. And nobody touched me. And so when I heard this Gracie guy doing what he was doing, I was like, man, I called everyone and no one's been able to touch me. Who's this guy? Like nobody from him or anybody that he had ever had trained ever came to my school and challenged me in a fight, even though I was the one doing the tryouts and saying, I'm looking for fighters and I'll, I want to see whoever wants to come in and, and, and go with me. Never had anybody do that. Wow. So Ken, everybody has an instructor. With you, however, it seemed like you were the person teaching, but I, I have never heard much about who you got your like instruction from. Yeah, that hence the the lion's den. I had nobody to train me. I mean, literally, you know, I went over to Japan, um, and I would go over and I would do a training over there after a fight. And then I would come back here and I literally was training myself, uh, watching tapes and watching fights. And I was a tough kid anyways. I mean, I grew up in the streets. I was in group homes, juvenile hall. Of course. I was locked up, you know. So I, I learned a lot on how to fight. Um, but I didn't learn how to fight professionally. But I had the heart of a lion or a, or a heart of a champion because you could beat me half to death and I'd keep getting up until the guy felt sorry or felt or his hands were hurt and he could stop beating on me. That's the kind of kid I was. It's like I was not going to give you the satisfaction of putting me down. And so I was able to take that and be able to learn professional fighting and be able to take some skill sets and put it together with that determination. Sky was the limit. Now, now Ken, back in 98, you know, when I, and I started fighting, you know, a long time after you did. But, I mean, what we would do there, there wasn't a lot of instructions either. I was training with a guy named Jason Godsey, and we would all kind of come together and, you know, be like, okay, um, I'm having trouble getting out of the mountain. Everybody just go and start working on getting out of the mountain. And we come together and talk. We were just teaching ourselves, learning that way. Is that kind of what you guys did? Kind of made up your own style in a way and just thought out what works and what doesn't work? I mean, we didn't really have anybody teach us. We taught ourselves. Is that what you did? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, a lot of mine came down to the pancreas um, catch wrestling, whereas yeah. I went over there and I learned as much as I could. Uh, and then I brought it back and then I started teaching my guys, but then I stayed over there for, I don't know, six months, um, had an apartment and wow. I really started to learn and really pick up what they were doing and their systems. And then I came back and that's when I started the gym because they wanted me to be the, the feeder for pancreas from the United States. And so that's uh, when I went over there for that long period of time. So they could train me their ways. Nice. Nice. Now, Carl Gotch was really involved with the beginnings of Pancrase as well. I, I had heard that Carl initially wanted Pancrase to be Jap Japan only, and he was against Americans fighting in the in the Pancrase organization. Yeah, Is that true and, to that? and he did. He didn't like us. I mean, I, I, as much as I like Carl, I think he was a great guy. He did not like me. Um, but he loved Boss Root and he loved guys from other countries. But he didn't like the U.S. Oh. and yeah, I just, it was weird. Uh, I, I could never figure it out. I, I just, I just never figured it out. And, you know, I mean, not that he would say bad things about me because Carl was a good guy and I, and I liked him a lot, but he just never, it just felt like he always kept me on the outside. Like he never, I mean, I remember when he would work with guys, um, I would have to go up to him and ask him stuff, but he would never come to me. And so it was frustrating, but again, like I said, I think, I don't know why, but maybe it was my attitude because I, I wasn't the, the, I wasn't the most, um, oh, what would you call humble guy? Uh, I, <laughs> I, 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 it, I, I let people know that if I was going to fight them, I, I was, I wanted to know who I was and I was, I was coming after them. And because that's the way I grew up, it was like, people are trying to take something from me. I'm going to let you know, it, you ain't getting it. Mm -hmm. 
with uh, your UFC one debut in the tournament, did when your conversations with Art Davy, was there any concerns about you fighting only a few days before in Japan? How did those conversations go? Well, first of all, nobody knew what was going to happen. I mean, I kid you not, the chances of that happening in our mind was like 10%. Like, it was literally, <laughs> it was literally that because in our heads, it's the United States of America. And there's no sanctioning body, boxing or karate or wrestling, uh, you know, collegiate, that would allow anything like this to be performed on the, the soil of the United States. They just wouldn't <laughs> let it happen. And, you know, I was over in Japan to prove it. I was over in Japan just to fight in what we thought was pretty crazy, which was punching, kicking, and then going to the ground and doing submissions. That, that right there was way crazy. Now to see this thing where it was basically a street fight, and that anything goes, that this was going to happen? No way. So the conversations were really never serious. They were always like, let's just go there. Let's see what happens. Chris, you had talked about the difference between the first generation of fighters with headbutts, no rules, and your generation of guys. W would you mind talking to Ken about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the the – Old school guys were, were awesome. Like, they were all, like, really pure fighters. Like, everybody was there. there. There wasn't, you know, a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of fame and notoriety. So the people who fought in your era were savages and just wanted to fight. You know, I think it, that's definitely – you have more athletes now. You have greater technicians, but they don't have the same mindset. You know what I mean? You, every, all the old school guys are just a different level of grittiness and toughness, which I appreciate. You know what I mean? I, it'd, be, it'd be awesome to combine the two. But a lot of the guys now, like you said, somebody's like – People get like I I have a sore foot. I can't fight in three months. I'm like, what? You know, like you had sore stuff every day when you fought. I, I just don't understand the mindset. They're they're technically they're probably more gifted athletes, but they're not mentally as tough, in my opinion. Well, you look at what uh, guys used to do back in them days. It was like a guy would break his hand, he would go in and fight the next fight, or he'd break his foot, he'd go in and fight the next fight because he didn't back out. You know, that was your only opportunity of winning, and everybody was hurt going into their second fight. So there was none of this now where guys go, well, I got a sprained ankle, and I can't go in and fight. It's like, dude, like, back then, man, a sprained ankle, people would beat the shit out of you for not going in and fighting because people go in there and fought with worse injuries because they knew this was their opportunity to do something, and that was, shouldn't stop you in my opinion, shouldn't stop you from going in there and still winning. I, I won with a broken hand. I beat Brian Johnson after I broke my hand. Yeah. And so I just seen a lot of guys. Gerard Godot, uh, you know, hurt, his, hurt himself in the first fight, went in and won his second fight, and then went in and fought Hoist, and, and all with the injury. Uh, I think he had a, 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 a tooth in his foot. Um, <laughs> so it, it's just a different mindset of guys. Um, again, like I said, he said they're, they're definitely a lot more technical and, you know, there's more money involved and, and different things like that. So guys are treating themselves more like a business, which is what they're supposed to do. But in our day, man, when you went in and fought, you had the toughest of tough and you didn't have to worry whether or not you were going to get the matchup that was put out there because there's nobody was going to step out of their fight and their opportunity. So the UFC is doing a 30 year anniversary. I know they just filmed all of you guys for you know, a little segment that they're going to they're gonna put forward. Do you think it's right that Jason DeLucia and Trent Jenkins were left off of that? I mean, granted, they were an alternate bout, but they fought on UFC 1. Yeah. I, <laughs> listen, I can go to my brother Frank. How in the world is he not in there? UFC Hall of Fame, yeah. Come on. Really? Uh, you know... They got Boss Root in there, and I love Boss. Boss a great guy. But Boss fought one tournament. One. He's got two fights. Frank went in there and destroyed people and then and went on and had a great career after that, and he's not even mentioned. Your corners for UFC 1, Takako Fuke and obviously your father, Bob Shamrock. Um, was it negotiated with you – coming from Pancrase that you would actually have to take them with you as corners. How did that work out? No, that was, again, that was something we had discussed early on when I was going to do it. Um, obviously um, having that doctor who had always worked on me, was really good at being able to 
make sure my muscles were in, you know, loose and relaxed and did a lot of the pin stuff that he would do to help uh, what they call trigger points with the pins and stuff. And I really liked that. So having him there, um, being able to prepare me, my body to, to be able to get ready to go in, and especially after he fought once, even though I didn't have time uh, to, to go back out and have anybody do, I didn't, I couldn't even, I had very time to change my story. I was like, done fight, then I had to go right back out. So it was pretty crazy on how it worked out. But bringing those guys was something that was already predetermined. We had already made those plans, and, you know, it was nothing negotiated. Again, like I said, it was a wild, wild west. Nobody really knew anything. It's out of respect. It was more respect than anything. Yes. Wow, that's excellent. Helio Vigio was your referee against Hoist Gracie. We're talking about somebody that's a black belt under the Gracie banner. He refereed thousands of jiu-jitsu matches. But in your match against Hoist, it seemed like he missed the tap that was right in front of him. Did, where do you? What was your opinion of him as a referee and that entire situation? I, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, um, when Hoyce had that choke on and I tapped on that thing, I remember thinking to myself, I just tapped. And I, I remember trying to pull it off. It was weird because he even to this day tells me he didn't use the gi. It was his arm. And I'm like, maybe I, I, everything I remember was I, all I felt was a gi wrapped on my neck and, um, and I couldn't grab the arm. Um, there was this, that, that tightness of a rope around my neck and, so I'm, you know, I don't want to argue about it because, like I said, I it was a long time ago, and that's what it felt like. Because if anybody gets me in a choke rear naked, there wasn't too many people that could choke me. Um, um, in fact, there's none because I didn't get choked. Um, that was the only time I ever got in a situation where I felt like I had no hand or arm to grab to literally force it off with my strength, um, and felt like there, I couldn't grab anything, and so. It is what it was, and, and if he says it was an arm, that's his. But it, it sure felt like a sure felt like a rope to me. <laughs> I, I, you were a gentleman about it too. Like you talked about the tap. Like you and Hoy said that. I'm not going to say it was a confrontation, but it was just like, come on, be honorable. And you know, Ken, you absolutely walked that line in that instance. Well, I, I mean, when he was doing, he was looking at me, and and again, this is another thing that shocks me now that I look back on it was that when he, I tapped and I'm thinking to myself, cause it was in my head. Like, I just, I, did, I don't, I'm like, I just tapped. Like, I can't believe I just tapped to this guy. <laughs> They're wearing pajamas, walk around wearing pajamas. I just tapped to this goofball. And yeah. uh, I remember looking up and the referee saying, go, go, go. And Hoist is going, you tapped, you tapped. And I remember looking at the ref and I was like, I didn't want to say it. And I was like, yeah, I tapped, man, I did tap. <laughs> and I was so mad because now that I look back on it and I thought to myself, Every single time that you watch a Gracie fight and the guy says, I want to go again, or I didn't tap, they say, let's go again. Okay, we'll do it again. Hoist Gracie didn't even make a move to say, okay, we'll keep going. Okay, you want to keep going? It was like, no, 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 you tap. You know you tap. Did not uh, want to go again. <laughs> All right, so, so, Ken, Jason DeLucia, you guys meet at UFC 1. He goes and trains with you afterward. How would you describe your relationship with him? With who? Jason DeLucia. Yeah, you know, I'd rather not just because there's things that I that he did that just, you know, really disappointing. Just very, very disappointing. Okay. Moving on. Um, Scott Pasak. He was the guy that yeah. initially talked to Art Davey. Um, Scott Pasak, you guys met at the boys' home, I believe. Yeah. Um, how would you describe your relationship with him? Yeah, Scott was one of those guys that had played um, the NFL, had an opportunity to play, kind of fell short. Uh, a lot of it wasn't his talent because the dude had plenty of talent. I think a lot of it had to do is he was just so aggressive, so intense, that probably at times was uncoachable. But I think he was a tremendous athlete because I, I believe he probably could have played. But again, he had that killer mentality where he just wanted to kill everybody, even in football. So uh, if he got to me, um, I had to prove it to him because I had just come back and I ended up doing something in Japan. And he was like, he couldn't believe that that was real. He thought it was fake. And he says, that doesn't work because it was a triangle choke, a leg triangle choke. And he's like, that doesn't work. And I was like, no, it does. And he goes, no, it doesn't. And I said, okay, I'll put it on you. And then if, if it doesn't work, you'll get out of it, right? And he goes, yeah, okay, yeah, let me see. So I throw the triangle on and he goes to try to pick me up and I grab his leg, I trap him and I squeeze harder. 
The next thing you know, he's unconscious. Now, this is a 280-pound guy that's 6'6", 280-pound guy, um, you know, jacked up and uh, telling me that what I do is fake. <laughs> so he said, okay, and I remember catching him, and he goes, let's do it again. I wasn't ready. I was like, what do you mean you weren't ready? I just put a choke on you. He goes, no, do it. I said, okay. So I put him in it again. <laughs> And then I said, I go, okay, go when you're ready. And so he goes to go again, and same thing. I choked him out again. And then that's when he goes, I want to do that. Scott, instead of, you know, getting mad at him, he goes, I want to do that. So I brought him into the gym, and, you know, Scott was one of those kind of guys I had to beat up. I had to literally rough him up so that I could break him down to build him back up again because I knew even in football – um, that was his downfall was that if he didn't have the attitude that he had where he wanted to just try to hurt and kill everybody, that he would have been a professional athlete. He would have played football. But because I believe coaches felt like he was probably uncoachable, um, that they just didn't want to deal with it. So when he came to me, that's one of the things I did. And I knew so. And I, I know people. And that's one thing I'm good at is I'm able to read people and I'm able to really work with people and bring them to their potential when it comes to sports. And I knew that if I could break Scott down, down, that I could build him up again and that he would do okay. I knew that he didn't have the ability to be the elite level because he didn't have any any grappling skills or ground skills. As far as stand up, he could throw he could throw punches. But the ground stuff was just he just never could catch on to that. But um he did he did enough to where, you know, he got himself into a place to where at least he could feel respectable um with what he had done. Because, again, like I said, his his ground stuff, as far as a football player, was tremendous. But as far as a grappler or a wrestler, he just never really got it. He was one of your soldiers, for sure. We had him on. He speaks very highly that of yourself. Yeah, he's a good dude. Like I said, I was one of the guys that, you know, I thought that, you know, unfortunately just didn't have the ability to really catch on to the ground stuff. Now, you know, the punch and you know, all that, he could always throw a big punch. You know, no question, big, strong, powerful guy. But just never really grasped that grappling. After UFC won, there was a rumor that you and Funaki went to train with uh, Jean- Jean-Jacques Machado. Is there right. any truth to that? Absolutely. Yes. How would you describe those training sessions? Uh, tricky. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like we went in with uh, – mindset to not to not overpower them because we were trying to work with them and get them involved with Pancras, their gym, to bring guys over to fight. So myself, Suzuki, Fanaki went over and rolled with these guys and we were just we're supposed to do enough to where it was kind of competitive. But not where we were going to go in and try to, you know, accidentally hurt somebody by catching them in a leg lock because they didn't know legs, right? I mean, they, they heard of them, but they just weren't that great at them. So we didn't For go sure. into a lot of that because we weren't going to turn, you know, show our cards. So we had a plan going in, obviously, just like everyone would. We don't want to show our hand, but we want to kind of entice them and bring them in because we knew that this style was taking off because of the UFC. And so we went in with them and tried to roll with them. And I remember uh, with myself, um, I never got caught. Um, but the I know, and I don't remember which one it was, but Fanaki wanted to go with one guy um, that was pretty aggressive, right? And it was one of the brothers. And so everybody kind of moved away and let those guys kind of go. And Fanaki was supposed to kind of, I mean, he again, it wasn't us about us winning anything. It was about us just trying to find out what it is they could do and what it felt like. And I remember there was like, and 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 Fanaki said, no gi, like let's just do bareback, no, no, no gi. So they had t-shirts on. So they were rolling around, and all of a sudden this guy's on there and 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 Fanaki kind of reaches up and he taps, and then Fanaki sits up and he goes, Hey, uh, in his in his broken English, because uh uh no gi, uh, you know, you know, no gi. And he goes, oh, I didn't do anything. And Fanaki looks, you know, pulls his shirt and goes this, and his shirt was stretched out, which means he rolled around and pulled his shirt across like he would a gi and choked him with his own shirt when they literally went into this thing bareback. Like, don't use 
you know, the gi or clothing. Don't use anything. And he kept saying, I didn't do this. The sure was stretched. <laughs> and he goes, Funaki looked at him and said, oh, okay. <laughs> Let's just let it go. But it was. It was tricky. And they knew what we were doing. I mean, they're not ignorant. We were in there and we were trying to test the waters. We wanted to bring them into us. So we had to make them look good, even though, you know, those guys were great. We don't know what would have happened if somebody goes hard. But that wasn't our job. Our job was to go in there, roll with these guys, let them know that we were we were a, a good enough, you know, to where they wanted to get involved with us. Um, okay. But not go in and literally try to hurt one another. Um, I felt like that's what they were doing because we were on their home turf. It felt like it was they had to they had to look good because we were coming in on the outside and me with my name and my reputation. They had to look good because this was their gym. And so we didn't we didn't challenge that. We didn't try to challenge that other than just going in and just training hard, um, but not going for like heel hooks or knee bars or stuff like that. That could cause somebody to get hurt. Um, Jerry Bolander and Pete Williams had to fight in your gym for the right to fight UFC eight. Um, how, how does that come about and who kind of forced that situation? Me. Were Maybe. you guys offered only one spot or was yes. it one spot? Okay. And um, I needed to see which one of those guys was going to, you know, step up. How would you and describe that fight? Uh, I would say it was pretty competitive, but, you know, Jerry just, Jerry had the wrestling, you know, he was just a tough, um, men mentally, he was much, much stronger than Pete. Um, physically, Pete, if he, if he would stop letting you know, the mental part of it get to him, could have been great. Um, had all the skills, you know, he knocked out Coleman, you know, I mean, like he literally had all the skills. But he, he mentally, he could never get right. Like, could never just be that guy that goes, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to win it. And nothing's getting in my way. It was always, you know, there was doubt in his mind all the time. Um, and Jerry just, like, was just nails, you know. Um, just like, he's just like a bull in a china shop. He's going to break everything. And, uh, and not feel any remorse about it. So um, he was, he was uh, Jerry was, was special. But Jerry... You know, the time when he fought and, and Mike, Mike, Mikey uh, Burnett will tell you the same thing. All three weeks training up into the Tito fight, we knew that he was done, that, that uh, Jerry was done. Physically, mentally, he did not want to fight anymore. He literally just shut down. And um, it just like he didn't want to be there. And he was doing this because he already committed to it. And uh, you could see it in the fight when he when he fought um, uh, Tito. He just wasn't there. Um, and Mikey could tell you, because we were standing there before we were supposed to go into into that fight with, with Tito, and he was blank. Wasn't the same guy. Mikey looked at me and goes, man, he's not there. And I was like, I know. Wow. Um, there seemed like, between yourself and Frank at the time, obviously there's there was, seemed to little, be a little bit of a tug of war, and Jerry Bolander was the rope. W was there a struggle between you two in regards to being his teacher? Say that again. Okay, so for instance, in some of Jerry Bolander's, one of Jerry Bolander's fights, it's he was announced as managed by Ken Shamrock, trained by Frank Shamrock. There seemed to be a little bit of like a tug of war in between like Jerry Bolander in regards to who he's training with yourself or Frank. Is there any truth to that? Um, no, I mean, no. Uh... It, what, this was probably when I was in wrestling. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Frank was training him. So I was trying to give Frank some credit uh, with me being oh. the obvious manager. So I'm trying to Frank's. I'm not training him. Frank's training him. So there was the opportunity for Frank to get recognition for that. So just like with Maurice Smith, if Maurice Smith was training Frank, he would be the trainer. So there was no absolutely. There was no, no understanding, or sorry, there was there was absolutely no friction at all between who was running the lion's den, period. That's good. Well, you know, Ken, I, I watch these things like a person that's mentally ill. 
So I just, you know, I take a little thing like that and it's like, wait a minute. We yeah, got something. Read, I think you could read into that, but that was, yeah. and, and probably because there was an effort to make that um, known, which is, was on my part because I was not training those guys anymore. I was doing the right thing. When, yeah, yeah. I was doing something else. So those guys, I wanted them to get the recognition. Yeah. You're doing the right thing. UFC three in our interview with Art Davey, he said when you had pulled out again uh, for the finals, um, he, these are his words. He said that you wanted hoist or nothing. You know, and Scott Bissack also mentioned this. You wanted hoist or nothing. And you pulled out more for the fact that hoist was no longer in a tournament rather than you being injured. What's your take on this? That is absolutely true. Um, I came there to fight hoist. And because I got beat by hoist, I was already a champion in Japan. You know, uh, I'd done everything there. Uh, I was in this new organization where I got caught by somebody that I disrespected and I was humbled. And I felt like the only way that I could bring back um, respect for him and me was for me to fight him again because I didn't respect him. And that was on me. And I needed to go back out there and fight him. So he respected me um, or, or that he would respect me because I did blow him off. I didn't think anything of him. And so I felt like I disrespected him and I wanted him to respect me. Um, and so I wanted to respect him also. And the only way I could do that was to fight him and give him my best. And also to be more prepared. I felt like going into that, nobody knew it was going to happen. Was it going to happen? Not going to happen. I fought a little bit before that thinking it wasn't going to happen. We go in there. There's supposed to be no rules. There are rules. You can't wear your shoes. You can't tape your hands, these things like that. And so there was a lot of this where I felt like I didn't give 100%. Like I didn't go out and do my best. And that was on me for not being prepared and not really taking it seriously. And so going into this fight, I trained to get that fight. I got it. I got the fight because I was supposed to fight it before that. He dropped out. And he dropped out because he was tired or injured. And I was thinking to myself, everybody's injured. Why? You're, oh, so you're special. You get to go in and make sure that you're 100% and everybody else goes in. And if they're injured, you say they're making excuses. But when you do it, it's okay. And so it's just frustrating to me for someone like him with his credibility that he didn't finish what he started. And so I thought to myself going into this thing, he was the guy I was there for and when he dropped out, my will to fight had gone. I had literally lost any will to fight. My focus had just completely turned to him. And then everything that I did from that point on was to make sure everybody knew that I wanted to fight him. I'm not here for the money. I'm not here for the fame. I'm here for you. And you passed on a $50,000 payday. Uh, your opponent would have been Harold Howard. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Scott Bissack in our interview said he pleaded with the UFC to let him in the tournament for the 50,000. Um, you love <laughs> yeah. Steve Jenham. You love Steve Jenham in there. He was, was an uh, alternate. Was that hard to watch? I, you know, I'm happy for anybody. You know, you get in there and you work, you get a chance and you make the best of it. You gotta be happy for him. Uh, for me, like I said, it was, it was about hoist. It was nothing else. $50,000. I wasn't there for the money. I was there for one guy. <laughs> $50,000 today is a lot of money, a <laughs> lot of money. And this, I mean, you were talking, you know, 94. Like I said, I mean, and, and, and I told her, I said, I'm, I mean, cause I, obviously I was, I had some, you see me limping out um, of the ring and, and, and I was getting ready to fight again. I was ready to go. When I heard that Hoist went in and threw in the towel, just so that he could collect the money. And not make the guy fight an alternate? I'm like, I'm coming after you. All right. Ken, here's this is part two. Okay. Harold Howard versus Hoist Gracie. They walk to the ring. They make the announcements. They ring the bell. Hoist throws in the towel. Are you aware that that's a no contest on Harold Howard's record? It's what? It's a no contest on Harold Howard's record. There's a no contest on Hoist's record, too. That's correct. Right. Yeah. It's a lot. You think that you think that's it's right? 
It's a lie. He forfeited. Absolutely. Yeah, he That's walked just... into the ring. He walked into the ring and got paid. That made it a loss. If he would have not walked into the ring and backed out because he was injured, then it's a no contest. But because he walked in, threw in the towel, he forfeited the fight. He lost. Fastest UFC finish ever. Ever. <laughs> yeah. This is my pursuit for justice for Harold Howard. I, I've got about a dozen of you guys so far commenting on that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I, we had also heard that your father, Bob, obviously an incredible human being with not what he did with both you and Frank, but with many, many other people that were in the system. Uh, we had heard through our, our interview with Art Davey that you and Bob really butted heads out of pulling out of UFC 3. Is there truth to that? Yes. Um, he, uh, he just, he, again, my father comes from a different background. Uh, it's, it's, it's more straightforward, pure in business. Um, and, you know, for me, it was more about what had happened early in the first fight and then me training everything for this fight and it not happening. There was nothing in my, nothing for me to be there. And you're talking about the one with Hoist, right? Correct. Yeah, there was no way that that I was going to step in and fight that fight because to me, it, it I felt like if I did that, I was allowing Hoist to get away with what he did. Force the super fight. It really did. Yep. It, more, it made them think about another way for them to get me and Hoist together because prior to that, they would have just had us do another tournament. You're correct. And so for me to go back out and say, no, I want Hoist. I want him. And everybody else wanted it. And it forced them to do what now we have is, a, is, is all just natural now or single fights. Bob Myrowitz was uh, the owner of the UFC at the time. What was your relationship like with him? I, you know, I mean, Bob was a business guy and I understood that. And he's going to do what's best for business. And I think when you come at it from that standpoint and you understand that, then having a relationship with him is a lot easier because you know that it's about business. Friendship can come later. Um, you can have a friendship, but it can't interfere with business. He really backed Tank Abbott as somebody that moved the needle. And it's almost like if, if he was picking, if we're in a schoolyard and he's picking fighters to, to, to put his money on or behind, it seemed like you were behind Tank for some reason in that pecking order in his head. Well, I think it's because Tank was marketable. You know? Wait, wait, Ken, wait, wait, Ken, with all due respect, I'm from Chicago. I'm from the Midwest. When I saw you, UFC won, and I thought Tank was cool, but I'm like, that's the guy. That's what I was thinking. So I don't understand how you or Bob or anybody else can say, well, Tank was more marketable. I just, I don't agree with that. Well, I didn't say more. I said he was marketable. Okay, for sure. So, okay. I think Tank was the, the new guy on the block uh, coming in, and Bob saw an opportunity that maybe Tank and myself I don't think he was negating me. I think he saw an opportunity to build somebody up. Unfortunately, every time Tank was supposed to fight me, like when he fought Oleg in the finals, he lost. So then I fought Oleg because whoever won that got to fight me because I had already established myself. And so um, Tank could just Tank could never get over the hump. Like he could never get to the elite level. He was always that guy that was exciting to watch. He would knock people out, but when he got to somebody that had skills, he would lose. Good promos, good on the mic, but there was a different yeah. level of athlete between yourself. Unfortunately, and him. if it was pro wrestling, he would be right up there with me in marketing. But because it's not pro wrestling and you had to have the goods, he could never get to that level. Would you guys ever, because he would always call you glam rock and he would throw little shots at you. You, one, you never bit on any of that, but did you guys ever have any confrontations at after parties or on the street? No, I think Frank and them did, and they got their ass handed to them, tanking them. So I never, I stayed out of the after stuff, fight stuff, 
um, especially with my fighters and with the group. You know, if I was going to go do something, it was normally with a different group because I was a role model. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, Other than our own events, I bring them in, and we had our own little parties and different things. I would I would actually organize that for us, not with outside people. One of the best interviews we've ever done on here was one of your former teammates, Tony Galindo. How would you describe your relationship with him? Oh, uh, um, man, I, I I couldn't even tell you. I just hadn't thought about him for years, but I think when things kind of got hard for me um, and, you know, obviously making the transition from fighting into pro wrestling. And uh, there was a lot of uh, a strain uh, with guys not, not knowing whether the gym is going to stay open, not stay open. And, uh, you know, unfortunately Tony made some decisions that I, obviously it's, again, it's my opinion. So unless you hear the whole story, you can't really take a side to either one. But I just, you know, I just felt like he made some decisions uh, and some moves that were not, um, not friendly to me. Okay, that's fair. In your book with Snowden, Ken, it's one of the greatest. Anybody listening to this right now, Shamrock by Snowden is one of the greatest reads ever. It's so brutally honest. Or what you put forth in there was more than I would have expected. Like the, the, the brutal truth that, that was put to paper is incredible. Um, wh what was your inspiration in regards to that? Like why, why did you allow something like that to come to print? And what was your motivation behind that? Yeah, first of all, um, I thought he did a great job on the book. Yeah. Um, except, for, yeah. except there were things in there that weren't true and none of them, that weren't true or, or any of the juicy parts. It's little things like the wrong name of a daughter, um, um, accusations of me hurting somebody prior to a match was just asinine, um, stuff like that. None of the other stuff that, you know, gets deep, all that stuff's true. You know, it's all, it's just those little things like that, that if he would have let me proofread it, he just put it out and didn't let me read it before he actually published it, which I thought that was our agreement that I would be able to at least confront anything that I didn't believe was true because I'm the one that gave him permission to go and talk to Guy and Trey and Alex and all these guys. I gave him permission and they called me asking if this is what I wanted. And I said, tell him the truth. They had all the truth. And so he wouldn't have got any of this without me saying, tell the truth. The only problem is, is some of the things that he put in there were guys like Jason and like Galindo that had fallen out with me, that had said things in there that were more favorable to them than to me. And so those are the things where I felt like you didn't give me a chance to confront those and prove them wrong or right. Other than that, I thought the book was awesome and it was great. Or even a different angle. Like, all right, that's his view. Let me give you my perspective. Exactly. Right. Well, no, and it's not because one of them was just a straight up lie. I mean, it was a straight up lie. I never hurt anyone going into a fight. Never. Huh. At UFC 6, Pat Smith gets jumped in the elevator by Paul Herrera and Tank Abbott. You were <laughs> witness to that. Uh, I don't remember it. Okay. They said that you're the one that helped uh, kind of break it up. Uh, police got involved, but okay. That's fair. That's fair. Um, your Olympic wrestling trials. 19 Was it 1988 or 1992? I've got two different 88. dates on those. 88. 88. What happened there? <laughs> I went in, uh, me and my friend Lance Hill, who I'd bounced in clubs with uh, here in Reno, um, we were out drinking and having fun at night. And then all of a sudden we heard about these trials, uh, that were here in Reno. And, uh, so I said, yeah, I used to be a pretty good wrestler. You know, I broke my neck, but I was undefeated my senior year and going to, I would have had a great chance of winning state. In my opinion, I was undefeated, um, you know, breaking my neck and, and you know, kind of just talking about the old stuff. And now this is probably five, four or five years out from me breaking my neck, um, in high school. 
And so Lance said, hey, we should go do it. He said, it's open. He's like, anybody can get in. And I looked at him, shut up. I said, you, you, you. he says, uh, well, I, I, I wrestled. And I was like, you wrestled. And he's like, yeah, I did. I said, okay, you want to go do it? I said, we can just walk in. He said, yeah. So we go in, walk in after we've been out most of the night, walk in, pay our thing, do the ways, jump in. And I remember my first one was a guy from Syracuse. And uh, I'd never wrestled freestyle. Like, I, I never wrestled freestyle. Mine was always collegiate. And, you know, how they did leg ties and rolls and, and, and you know, taking someone down is only one. I didn't know. I just went in and did it. So I picked the dude up. I slammed him. And I remember pinning him in 30 seconds. Literally just stuck the dude. Next guy goes out. I wrestled this dude. I beat him on points. There's a break uh, in between. And so Lance does his. And, of course, he gets me beat in the first one. And then uh, I go out and I go against, I think, and I, I don't correct me, but I think it was Shear, Bill Shear. I think he was a 198 pounder or something like that, 198 pounder. And I remember going in and I didn't know anything about any of these guys. And next thing I know, I'm getting just flipped like three times in a row. Wham, wham. Because I remember, I remember going down. And as I went down, I literally went to, to kind of cause collegiate, right? <laughs> so I ended up trying to get on all fours and stand up. And when I did it, next thing I'm in mayor. And in collegiate, you can't do that, right? You can't, you know, stick a guy on his head. And I remember he did this like three, four times. And the next thing I know, he guys get his hand raised. And I'm looking around going, what happened? What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? He didn't pin me. <laughs> he attacked me. And I literally yeah. was like standing there confused, like what just happened? <laughs> uh, you know, Ken, nowadays in wrestling, Jiu-jitsu gives a lot of the wrestlers funk. It gives them like the ability just to kind of be a little bit funky. Right. And you can see how somebody like yourself could probably beat people with better accolades than yourself at wrestling because of your shoot fighting funk. Right. Yeah, it's awkward. It's different. Yeah, it's a look that they're not going to get in the gym. Mark Coleman went and trained with you. There are rumors that you got to take down against him. Is there any truth to that? Dude, that's training. I'll never talk about training. Not not like that because it, none of that stuff matters. You know, whatever I did to him was training, and n none of that stuff matters. And but you hear guys talk about training, what they do to somebody. That none of that doesn't matter. Like that's just all training, and people get things done in there because you're tired or because you got uh, you went five minutes prior to someone else, and and you're there to make that guy work hard so he's ready for his fight so anything that you do to somebody in training is only because you're preparing them to get ready to win a fight period in your match against leon van dyke um he broke his ankle was there bad blood there you've never commented on it not with leon that was one of the ones where i was frustrated because of something suzuki did um uh, where he popped my knee and and uh, I was frustrated because it, it, again it felt like something extra and so after that I went on a rage um, <laughs> and just started just going after people but that one there it wasn't wasn't on purpose it was just because he when he reached up to try to pull or roll he kind of rolled into it and it just it, it it broke and it wasn't like I said that was not intentional at all okay like you said, me looking at those fights now, I, I try to read into things. I figured it was a, a direct message to Bas Rutten or something like that. I would never do that to someone like Leon who didn't have the skill sets to, to compete with me. I wouldn't do that. I, I, I just wouldn't do that because it, he, he, he didn't and not to put him down, but I was just so much more skilled than him. Um, you know, and, and boss was so much more skilled than him. You know, we were two of the better guys and I wouldn't do that to somebody. And so if that, 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 whatever that was, you put that out because there's just no way I would do that to somebody. It's just an accident. I mean, it's, it's a fight. Things happen yeah. in fights. And, and yeah. it wasn't like, it, it seemed like it was so quick that it was just like, maybe across the finish line before even you expected to do that. Well, and you get somebody like him who was a really strong kid. He doesn't look it, but he's very, very strong. And so you got a, a leg that's just really strong and you're trying to turn it and it, and some, you can feel someone that are weaker than most, but his was like freaking iron. I mean, like he had strong limbs. And so when I was cranking that thing, I was trying to get it to turn enough. So we tapped. And then, he, and then, you know, it broke. But again, like I said, it wasn't something that I would, that I, that ever thought about doing on purpose. 
Okay. Um, with your fights in Pancras, I'm going to list some fights. Shamrock versus Hume, Shamrock Funaki 2, Shamrock Suzuki 1 and 2, or any of those works. No, I, I just, you know, those are business, man. I'm just not going to get into those. Fair <laughs> shake. It, it can get absolutely fair shake. Um, it was a different world back then. It absolutely. Did you ever roll with Bill Corp? Um, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. There is a famous incident at King of the Cage where you met up with Mark Hall in the bathroom <laughs> where you had security outside of it, uh, Vernon Tiger White and Tony Galindo. Um, do you care to open up on that? Yeah, Mark, in, I don't know what got into him, but I always liked Mark. I thought he was one of those guys that overachieved. You know, he had some some disabilities. He overcame those. He was a fighter and he wasn't afraid of anything and had all the right, you know, traits and just felt like a good person. And then he calls me one night because of some fight that he's supposed to have. And he wants me to fight at it. And I, I just not going to do it. And he threatens to burn my house down and kill my wife. And I'm like, I like, like, where did this come? Like, it went from this one guy to this complete cycle. And I just, you know, me, I don't, I don't bite into it. I just hung up and, you know, just, I'm not going there. And just blew it off. Like, I'm not going to deal with them. And I remember myself and a few of the fighters were going to this fight that we had um, outside of San Diego. And I remember as I was driving there, and I had a few guys with me, um, I, I don't remember who called me, but somebody called me, either Guy or, or Vernon, or somebody called me and said, hey, Mark's here, and he's talking all kinds of smack. Like, when he sees you, he's going to do this, he's going to do that. And I'm laughing, I'm going, are you serious? And they're like, dude, I'm telling you, man, he's out here just talking. And I said, all right, well, I'll be there in about 45 minutes. And um, I said, we'll figure out what goes, what goes. So I get there and the media as I come in, the guys know I'm here and they all come up to me and they go, hey, man, he's down there in the hallway near the bathroom. And so I start walking that way. And as I'm walking that way, <clears throat> we get to the hallway and I look over and Mark's there and I go, hey, Mark. I said, I hear you got something you want to say to me. And all of a sudden he has two of his guys that start walking behind us because I'm, I'm going to bring him down the hallway. I said, come on down here and we can have a talk. And as we're walking my guys are behind me and then mark because he knows i'm coming had set a couple guys up around the area to be able i don't know what he was thinking if he's going to jump me or whatever he was going to do i don't know but vernon and guy and i think it was guy whoever was there ended up blocking them out so is that as me and mark were walking the crowd stopped <laughs> and it was just me and mark walking behind these two doors and as mark turned around he realized it was nobody there it was just guys standing there watching and his guys weren't there <laughs> and uh, i remember all of a sudden things just kind of changed for him like all of a sudden the world that he thought he was going to be in had severely changed and as we're standing there and i looked at him and i said what is your problem like what is your problem with me he goes well you're supposed to do this thing and do this thing and you back down i said mark I ain't obligated to you. I said, I did that as a favor and I can't do it because I have other things that came up. It's not my responsibility to do something for you. And I wasn't even getting paid for it. I was just going to go do it as a favor at his fight. But then I started hearing things of some of the fights that he had and, and some of the, the antics they were doing. And it just wasn't my thing. I wasn't going to get involved with that, with, you know, topless girls and all that other stuff that they had going on, stick fighting, this crazy war stuff inside of a cage. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. And so he got all pissed off because I wasn't going to show up and threatened to burn my house, do all this stuff. Now we're here at this place and I've got him standing there in the hallway with everybody being blocked off by my guys and everybody's standing there watching. And I'm looking at Mark and I'm saying to him, you need to step off, just back off. And he looked at me and he goes, well, I can't do that. He says, you disrespect me. And I'm looking at him, what the hell are you talking about? And as he and and, and I'm a, like I said, I, I fought for a long time, so I know people's reaction. And so he starts to turn his shoulder as he's standing in front of me. He turns his shoulder sideways. And I remember peripheral. I'm looking at his body and his hands are down to the side. And I see his hands ball up on the back hand as he starts to ball his hand up. And I'm like, is he actually going to try to hit me? 
this dude has got to be freaking completely psycho. And so as he pulls up his fist, he goes to swing at me, and I'm just, I, I, I just see it. It's like slow motion. He goes to swing at me, and I just, right from where I'm standing, just like, bam, popped him right in the face, drops to the ground. I literally just smash his head about four or five times into the wall, and I walk away. And all of a sudden, ambulance comes, they pick him up, they take him away, they put him in ambulance, they take him to the hospital. He tries to sue me. And I just said, okay, I'll tell you what. Um, why don't you guys, because it, you know, it's at a casino, and the fight's at this casino. I said, why don't you guys go ahead and take a look at the, the footage? And, uh, and you tell me <laughs> whether or not he has a case. And so they looked at the footage, and it's sure as shit. They saw he went to take the first swing, and I beat him to it, period. Game over. Wow. Hicks and Gracie. Real, real, real quick, Ken, I yeah. just want to say, I went to a couple of Mark Hall shows myself, and you not attaching your name to it, that was a solid move. That was a good move yeah. on your part. Yeah, and it wasn't like I had anything against Mark. It's just I heard the shows he was putting on, and I was like, I can't do that. I was I was at one that had a 300-pound woman fight at old guy. So, yeah, you don't want your name on that one. Yeah, it was, it was like <laughs> Cobra, was just, uh, Cobra Fighting Federation, right? That's right. Yeah, legendary. Yeah, a lot of belt buckles in the fights back then. Let's talk about Hicks and Gracie. He made a pretty strong play about trying to get into UFC 3. Obviously, the negotiations fell apart. Were you aware of Hickson and his legacy or have any concern about him coming into the UFC? I, I felt, you know... Andy Hickson, in my opinion, was one of the greatest martial artists. Um, just never got the opportunity to really be at, at that USC level. But I felt like if he would have gotten the opportunity, he would have been able to show very well. I think that, you know, obviously, as my skills got developed more and more, um, I felt like I would have been a great matchup for him. Yeah, no, I I knew that he was kind of toying around. I know he went to Japan rather than being in the UFC. I was always surprised that uh, you or anybody from your gym never really matched up with him, especially in California. Uh, he, um, he was pretty picky on who he fought. Um, and obviously, you know, he put himself up there at, uh, at a price range that, you know, that there's just no way um, companies are going to be able to sustain especially if he's just a one-off. I mean, their companies are looking to build names and build characters and be able to have guys represent their company, and he would come in and represent him, which is smart. He built his own business and his own brand, and he wasn't going to let anybody take that away. And so by him trying to sign with the UFC would mean that his his brand would be behind UFC, not in front of UFC. And uh, that's why he never really got the opportunity to fight for these bigger organizations because it was going to be his brand and it was just a one-off. He would fight one time and then he'd leave. And that's, in my opinion, that's smart because you don't get guys a chance to really settle in and watch and see what it is that you do or fight you once and then come back and fight you again knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are and get better at being able to prepare to beat you. So he, he, was, he was smart about that just fighting guys one time and then moving on to guys that didn't understand or know exactly what he could do or couldn't do. Ken Shamrock, you're an absolute living legend. We're at our time limit right now. I honestly, I, I cannot explain to you how much I appreciate what your contributions to the sport of mixed martial arts was. It has changed my the direction of my life irrevocably. Thank you so much, sir. Well, I appreciate you. And man, listen, man, you guys can't forget October 27th, Valor Bare Knuckle, the second event. It's coming out. And just like the early UFCs and this new thing that people are coming to watch, this is it, man. It's the vision is different. There are no ropes. There are no cages. There are no tape on the hands. It's God given talent, no clinching. It is a fantastic fight when you watch it and visually explosive. Don't miss it. October 27th, the University of Florida. Come check it out, Jacksonville. I'll probably be there. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it, buddy. All right, dude. There we go. Joey Venti. Hey. And we are on. On our way to this UFC one kick in October. That one didn't disappoint. No, it didn't. It was great to finally get him on. And you've got to feel vindicated that he agreed with you about Harold Howard. You know, Joey, there's, there's, there's not many things in life 
that that guy cho- choose this to be the hill that I stand on. <laughs> but Harold Howard, it's just it's it's just too hard for me to accept that it's not a win on his record. Ken <clears throat> Ken said something that nobody else so far mentioned, which is Hoist got paid for the fight. If Hoist got paid for the fight, that was a fight. You lost yeah. the fight. That's so, not a no contest. No, and and you know what? This is you got to remember. We're going to forecast into the future here. I think Fabi, Fabiano Iha in our interview with him that has not aired yet. I bet you he agrees with that. He's a reasonable guy. I think he He's might agree with that. Real good dude. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we need you to like, share, subscribe. Um. YouTube is finally coming together. We got this guy, Tyson Green. Uh, He is our local welder, and he is putting up these clips, and it's really kind of helped build our audience on YouTube. However, we also need some people on Spotify and iTunes and, uh, you know, people's podcast apps. If you guys could please help spread the word, it is greatly appreciated. Joey, what else do we have in this month, at least on the docket, potential interviews that we might get? For October, potential interviews, Gerard Gardeau. Gardeau that's the great I, white whale that we're hunting. We've got. Uh, I'll Kaylee pay Tooley. for that, dude. Yes. dude. I'll pay for Gardeau. I, I mean, I Kaylee, know it's probably going to happen. I would do yeah. that. Taylor Tooley has agreed to do it. We got Zane Frazier in the books, getting ready to post. We're going on a tear with the UFC one veterans and uh, even the manager of Kevin Rogier. Charlie Angelo, and we're gonna we're gonna get an episode with him. He's been front row center for a lot of MMA history, and he was there at the beginning at UFC one. So I'm excited about that one. Yeah, and Angelo is actually gonna be a really good one. I mean, you're talking about Ranger Stott and Harold Howard's manager, his perspective of that incredible fight with Royce Gracie and Harold Howard. Yeah. I guarantee the levels that we can get out of that half second victory is going to, you know, just really really put Harold Howard, maybe even on the Mount Rushmore of MMA. I would love to see a mullet on that. (laughs) (laughs) Not not so much for fighting, just for the look in general. I think I'd like to see Harold Howard on there. (laughs) He'll he'll be in the Hall of Fame in the methamphetamines wing. (laughs) You drive your car through a casino after losing your ass swing, uh, Harold Howard. (laughs) You know what, dude? If we had a brick and mortar Hall of Fame, I would probably try to reclaim the car that he drove onto the uh, the casino floor, and you know maybe like you know the JFK assassination vehicle that could be kind of like our yeah you know, that could be just our key piece that people can go and sit in and feel and touch. People would travel from all over the country for that. Yes, <laughs> hey, I've 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 got a plug before we we uh... please. <laughs> all right. If you're in the Los Angeles area, Pasadena Fight Academy, it's run by a professional fighter, Savant Young. He's been a guest on our show. Uh, they do all levels from kids programs to people training to be professional fighters. Check them out. Pasadena Fight Academy. I also do color commentary. I do play-by-play for Ignite Fights. Uh, we got a few events coming up. We're located in the Midwest. We do Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois. Um, I think we're going to delve into Wisconsin as well. So I'm pretty busy with them. If you guys like regional MMA, I'm a huge fan of that. So I've seen, I'd rather go see that than a live UFC. So, I mean, I'm at those probably two, three weeks out of the, out of the month as well. So please uh, ignite fights. That really helps as well. Joey, any, anything on your end? That's it. Pasadena Fight Academy. I forgot cool. to mention, you get to train with Herb Dean. He's there twice a week. So, uh, you will bump shoulders with some some UFC royalty there. So, so Joey, when are we getting Herb? Well, probably right after I dog sit for him when he goes on his <laughs> next road trip, because then he's definitely going to owe me a favor. <laughs> I've never asked him for a favor, but I'm cool with exchanging favors. So we will get him on for sure. You do. You better make sure that dog just eats the prime, you know, dog food. While he's I love him. his dog. I love her, but I like his dog possibly more. So it's going to be fine. <laughs> and he, no, and he, he, he's well aware of that. That's good. That's good. Joey, in all honesty, man, dude, thank you so much for all of your help, helping put this together as well. This UFC one October. Um, so far, so good. We got three in a can, hoping to get two more. And if we can get two, we can get four more after this. If we can get seven in total, we can bring it up to November 12th, which is the actual 30th anniversary date of UFC one. All right. Exciting stuff we're doing. 
check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.